That's good. All right. Ah, Sean, good to see you. Good morning, everybody. It's good to be with you all this morning. And uh, let's go ahead and pray and we'll get started. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we're glad for the opportunity to be here together as a church family. And as we spend some time in your word this morning, we ask that you would be with us, giving us understanding. And we say this in Jesus' name, amen. So a little bit of a Tom history lesson. So back in 2005, in the fall of 2005, I went to a small evangelism college out near Portland, Oregon, to learn how to study the Bible with people and do different types of evangelism. And one of the things that we had to do there is we had to do a lot of scripture memorizing. We had to memorize Bible studies. And uh, I really learned how to memorize scripture when I was out there. And then after I spent some time there, I ended up doing some Bible work down in Florida. And I was kind of, I was very much by myself down there a lot of the time. So one of the ways that I kept myself occupied was by memorizing a lot of scripture. And I, like, I memorized the Sermon on the Mount and uh, a few other, lots of other chapters. And one of the things I did was I looked up chapters that Ellen White recommended to memorize. And so there's a few out there that are pretty familiar that she recommends to memorize. So we have Isaiah 51, Isaiah 53, we're talking about the prophecies of the Messiah. Isaiah 58, we're talking about the true fast and what it means to really worship. And then a couple others that she recommends to memorize are 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, talking about spiritual gifts, our motivations, and how the Holy Spirit works in the context of a church and church order and stuff. And so I, I tacked on chapter 14 too, just so far as the context of, you know, church order and whatever. But, uh, you know, uh, so the, to tie this together, one of the things that I've been doing for personal worship lately is reading through the New Testament. And so I just finished reading through 1 Corinthians. And it was nice to pass over just some chapters that I'm pretty familiar with in the past. So I thought we could take some time this morning and study through 1 Corinthians together, at least, and at least hit some of the high points. So if you will turn with me this morning, we will be spending our time together in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we'll just get started in verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. So it was important to Paul for the church of Corinth that they understand spiritual gifts. Uh, by extension, you know, as us also as the church, uh, it's important for us to understand them also. And then so why did Paul want the church to understand spiritual gifts? And he answers that in verse 2. You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. So first of all, their background was idolatry, so it's important, the, the worship of other gods. They needed to be educated on how true worship works. And secondarily, these are, are dumb, non-speaking idols, these gods that don't interact with humanity. However, we do have a God that interacts with humanity, and so we have to change our expectations about how we interact with God. And so spiritual gifts are one of the ways that God interacts with us. And so it's why Paul wants the church to be familiar with him and to be knowledgeable about these things. So verse 3, Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and obviously, if we're talking about spiritual gifts, a foundational piece of understanding them is that they come from the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Spiritual gifts are given to us to minister on behalf of Jesus and for Jesus, and that comes through a connection with the Holy Spirit. And we're able to manifest that in ministry. So on to 4 through 7 now. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. So after our two or three verse introduction to the, the concept of spiritual gifts, Paul is transitioning here into his main point, that uh, these gifts of the Spirit enable us to work together in different ways, all towards the same goal. Though we might have different gifts, different ministries, and different activities, we are working towards one common goal, the glorification and enjoyment of God. 
And another, another reason that these few verses here are interesting is because it's one of the few sort of, you might say, Godhead or Trinitarian passages in the New Testament where it lays out the three members of the Godhead together. We have the Spirit first, and then we have the Lord Jesus, and then God the Father. And so maybe you've wondered before why the Father is referred to as God and Jesus is referred to as Lord. And so my take is that Paul and the other New Testament writers are very concerned that we understand that Jesus is our human connection that bridges the gap between us and the divine. He wants us to understand that Jesus is how we connect back. Obviously, it's not a a difference in the qualitative nature uh, because there's plenty of passages that talk about the divinity of Jesus, but uh, in other places of the Bible, but they want us to understand that connection. So coming back to the point about different types of ministries and different types of ways that God works, works through us all, I want to continue the, the Tom history lesson. So um, <clears throat> this is a little bit before 2005, so maybe like 2002 or 2003, just as I was, I think, transitioning into college. Uh, we had a, a young pastor in the Bowling Green Church um, fresh out of seminary or college or, or something, and um, it's pretty nice for me. My dad's not really that active in my life, so it was nice to have a young pastor who was, you know, pretty active, engaged with me quite a bit. And, man, I don't know how he did it, but that Bowling Green Church, I mean, like, we'd have like 30 people on a Sabbath or something, like maybe high tide is like 40 during the really good years. But we built like a radio station. We funded like a Bible worker back in those days. Looking back, I just really don't know how he did it, but um, you know, God can do amazing things with willing people. So not only with this young pastor, he had a, a young friend of his come and was our Bible worker during those times too, also, you know, really good for me. And uh, this, I think, was during like the first year, first year or two that we started a campus ministry on the campus of Bowling Green State University. And so one of the things that we did as a ministry was we called it a discipleship weekend where we would travel to another church and essentially it's like a combination of a revival weekend and then helping them to start ministries. So we would come in, um, you know, Friday night, Sabbath morning, and do uh, a revival series of messages. And then Sabbath afternoon, we would bring everyone together and then focus on ministries that the church could do. And we would do that by asking, so who really feels like they should start some sort of ministry for the church? And just kind of get an idea of, I mean, obviously not everyone's going to respond to that, and that's okay but just an idea of who has different things that are on their hearts. And then we would go around and see who would want to support people in the different aspects of ministry. And it's nice because we all have different functions and we all have different roles. Just because someone is leading out in a ministry, I mean, it could be a function of personality, right? That's okay too. But we're all working together in a commonality towards one mission, one goal, um, the advancement of the church and really the advancement of uh, the appreciation of our Savior. So... Um, it was pretty enjoyable. It was a really fun thing to be a part of and just encouraging people to step up and to be a part of and start different ministries. And then we would cycle back through, uh, visit the church again six months later and then just see how things were going and see if we needed to do some more encouraging. So back to 1 Corinthians. We have made it through verse 7 and we are in verse 8 now as we continue our thoughts here. For to one is given... By the Spirit, the word of wisdom. Uh, It's in my head in the King James, I guess. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healings by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So Paul here, as we see, there's several different, you could call them lists, if you will, of spiritual gifts in the New Testament. So we have, I remember them sort of like by the 12. So we have Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, and I think it's also Ephesians 4, if I remember right. Is that right? Yeah, Ephesians 4. So the point that Paul is doing here is he's not, he's just kind of giving us a collection of different spiritual gifts. But the main point of his telling us about these spiritual gifts is that it's the these different gifts are given by one spirit. It's all together working towards one purpose. Again, and if we think about, maybe it's a little bit more apparent to me as I just finished reading through 1 Corinthians, but there's a lot of disunity happening in in Corinth. And Paul is spending a lot of 
his message in this letter, trying to bring people back together. I'm of Paul, I'm of Paulos, I'm of Peter, I'm of Jesus. Well, I'm better, I you know, was Jesus. And he's like, no, you know, we're all, <laughs> we should all be rowing together in the same direction. And he's really trying to help people understand that we're together in this. We shouldn't expect to have the same gift as someone else, and we shouldn't hold it against someone else if they don't have the same gift as us. We all have different abilities and different gifts. So we just read through a list of spiritual gifts, and a little bit of a pop quiz for those that are brave this morning. I know y'all aren't expecting to talk to me, but can you think of any other gifts here, in, spiritual gifts that aren't listed here in this passage? Just kind of looking at this, are there any that pop out? And I'm going to mention a couple of spiritual gifts that maybe you've never thought of are spiritual gifts before, too, that are mentioned in the Bible. But are there any gifts here that don't? Yes? Hospitality. Hospitality? Okay. Any other brave souls that want to? Pastoral ministry? ministry? Yep. Pastoring and teaching. So a couple, yes? Ability to write? write? Definitely. And a couple that I want to mention, uh, Samson had a supernatural gift of strength, right? That was a spiritual gift. It was a gift that the Spirit gave him. Uh, Another one that I want to mention is a spiritual gift of craftsmanship. And this pops up a couple times uh, in the construction of the tabernacle, right? You had Bezalel, who was gifted. And it wasn't just him. There was a, there was a collection of other guys that were, that were gifted with the ability also. And this pops up again when Solomon was building the temple. He writes to the king of Tyre, and it so happens that there was a guy of Dan who was living over there in the kingdom of Tyre who, I don't know, ended up being genetic, I guess, you know. He's a descendant of one of those guys, and he had that gift ability as well. So, we have these lists here, but I, I don't want you to think that these are necessarily comprehensive lists because the Spirit can work with us in many ways. Because remember, the point of it is we're accomplishing the work of Jesus. And that can take, diff- and look, take different forms and look different ways. Okay, here. So now we are transitioning after verse 11 into unity and diversity and one body. Starting verse 12 here. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we are are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. So one of the great things about church is that it's it's a mixing ground of, of people that might not actually ever get together outside of this commonality experience, right? So whether it's socioeconomic, whether it's race, whether it's generational, it could be anything else too. Uh, Church is something that should bring us all together as fellow believers. I mean, here we have that he, he lists out here some sort of extremes that we don't even necessarily experience in our culture, like slave or free or whatever. Uh, distinctions that would would probably separate us quite a bit more than we would expect, but we come together and we worship together. And in 14, he really goes after people who are like, well, you know, like, you have a poor guy here, and you kick him out of a seat, and you give it to the rich guy. He's like, what are you doing? Chapter 14. So, uh, I also, in verse 14, I like a picture that Paul, a word picture that Paul gives us. Uh, And we have all been made to drink into one spirit. Now, if you would allow me a little bit of a liberty... I like to think about this as Paul giving us a picture of a flower vase. We're all different types of flowers, look all different types of ways, smell different ways, but we're drinking out of one flower vase, which is the Holy Spirit who gives us life. I think it's a pretty picture there. If that's what he's talking about, who knows? So then let's see, we're picking up in verse 15 then of 1 Corinthians 12. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now has God set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? And so we should kind of expect to have different ministries. We should expect it to function differently in different ways. But... Uh, sometimes we look at, at different people and we say, man, you know, I think sometimes we look at people who have a, a more public ministry 
And we judge ourselves by that and we say like, oh, I can't minister because, man, I just really hate getting up in front of people. But that's not how God is working in the church because some ministries are public, some ministries are private. So where I'm going is that peer pressure isn't something that only happens to children and teenagers. It's something that obviously that follows us through our lives as adults also. We measure and judge ourselves in many different ways and something that stands out to me sort of in the context of church and I've, we, we've all seen it before and we've all experienced it before. We get to a name in the Bible that we don't know how to say and we're not necessarily comfortable in saying it and then we feel very self-conscious and just like sounding out the name. Let me just tell you, nobody cares really how you say it. Nobody's going to think less of you because of how you pronounced a word. I mean, at the end of the day, we have ideas that we think about how the Hebrew and the Greek are said, but really they're dead languages. I mean, we have a modern Hebrew and a modern Greek, but technically they're dead languages. So it's okay. And if you were to be reading it in a Spanish congregation, it would be different words. It's okay. But this translates to, you know, like I was saying, ministry types. We look at other people and we think, my ministry isn't as important as that person's ministry because it's much more public. So, for example, uh, you know, I went to this evangelism school that I was telling you guys about, and I have friends that are exceptional in ministry. Uh, in the course of my life, even, even in the two years that I spent Bible working and, you know, like the summer that I spent canvassing, I've only ever taken, like, one friend through all the way to, to like, baptism. But I have friends that are just, like, like automatic. Even, even, you know, Shane has had a lot more success in ministry than I have. So should I look at that and just say, like, man, I should just, like, give up and let him do all the work? That's not really how it goes. We all have different experiences and different abilities. And uh, one way that I want to, to illustrate this is going back to my college days, um, so my brother did high school in three years, we're four and a half years apart, and I took three years off of college, so it worked out, so by the time I came back to my, man, I, freshman, the third year, whatever, what's the third year called again? I'm so long. I'm, see, I'm, I'm in front of people and I'm nervous, I forget it, so. <laughs> <laughs> by the time I got back to my third year, my brother and I were matched up. So we were going through and we graduated undergrad together, and then we graduated our masters at the same time, just different places. So anyhow, uh, we had both gone to, to Mission College and learned how to give Bible studies and whatever. And so we were involved in different Bible studies. We were involved in the campus ministry together. And one of the friends that he was studying with, um, he was a trumpet performance major, and so he knew a lot of the musicians. And so he was studying with this girl who was an oboist. I mean, you guys have heard possibly of like, like one-man dogs or one-person dogs that really only like pay attention to one person and take orders from like one individual and just kind of ignore everyone else. You're like, hey, you know, come here. And they're just like, I'm really only caring what this person says. Well, she really only understood things when he explained it. And like, not me. <laughs> so I remember one time, this is like in my mind, we were in, this, in the little Bowling Green church. We're downstairs and it's potluck time and we're like, we're eating. And I think she asked a question or something. I don't remember the specifics, but you know, I'm, I'm explaining something or answering a question. She just like, Blank, blank faces me, just, okay. And then she looks at him, and then he says the same thing that I did, and she gets it. I'm like, I just said that. And she's like, you didn't say that. And he's like, actually, he did say that. This is very interesting, you know? Um, and then uh, I had a similar experience when I was Bible working down in Florida. I had a Bible study with a, a young lady who was uh, in occupational therapy school, and um, you always met in Barnes & Noble for the Bible study. I'm not I mean, a single lady one-on-one -on -one in her house, but uh, I had a friend of mine um, that I went to evangelism school with, a youth, uh, he's a conference youth director now, and he just happened to be visiting. We were studying uh, Daniel chapter 8 and 9, 2300 days. I typically love that Bible study, giving it, it's clear, don't have any problems with it, but that day, she just wasn't getting it, just wasn't understanding it. But because he was there, he just explained it simply, and we were done. You know, it was just really wonderful that he was there on the particular day that she had a problem with understanding. And I just think it, it shows us that the ministries that we have and the backgrounds that we come, come, come from and how we explain things, even though it's a little bit different. This is why we, we have different favorite pe preachers, right? You know, like, oh, I like so-and-so from that ministry, or I like so-and-so from that ministry of that church or whatever. It's because we all resonate with different things. And that's okay. It's okay if it's a little different. God can use us in different ways, and that's wonderful.
So looking at the time left, I want to go down to the end of the passage here. And let's pick up in verse 27. I'm kind of land the airplane here. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, do all have gifts of healings, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. So Paul is bringing this um, parenthetical thought on spiritual gifts to a close as he transitions into the motivations that we have for ministry in the next chapter. Um, but this time, you know, it's, it's similar to what we read earlier in the chapter, 1 Corinthians 12, but it's a little bit different of a list. So before it was unordered, and now it is an ordered list. And I think it's, it's somewhat surprising that what Paul is saying here is that some gifts are more important than others. Some gifts have a higher priority within the church. Uh, so with the young adult group, one of the things that we do is we have a monthly Friday night Bible study. And so I think this happened a couple times ago, but Joel did an exercise with us where we, first of all, you know, we're, we're on a boat in the middle of the Pacific and we have to order a list of survival items as to which is most important. The follow-up exercise to that was, here's a list, list of spiritual gifts. How do you order them? And sort of my perception of the reaction to that within the rest of the room was, I mean, shouldn't they all be equal? I mean, they're gifts of the Spirit. I mean, how do you, how do you prioritize that? But it's interesting here that Paul is prioritizing that. You know, first apostleship, secondarily prophecy, then, if I remember right, teachers, right? And then it kind of goes down there. Um, again, not that that makes the person or whatever better, but I think some missions come with more of a weight. I mean, do we need good teachers in the church? Is that really important? Within the context of a group, that's very important. And, I mean, some gifts, like the gifts of apostleship, um, and in my understanding, that would be a couple things. One, like the first-generation Christian leaders. Those are like the capital A apostles. And I think in our day, the lowercase apostles are people going into new territories, like missionaries or something like that. And obviously, prophecy, that's a pretty rare gift within the church. But I think some of these things come with a greater weight and a greater responsibility, even like elders or pastors, teachers within the church. You know, maybe we don't necessarily want that weight or that responsibility. But that's okay. Where we are, God is able to use us in different ways to accomplish his mission and ministry. And for us, we get to come into a better relationship with God through the Holy Spirit, a better connection, and ultimately the relationship to uh, share and enjoy God throughout eternity. And I guess just, uh, let's see, I had another thought there, but we can, we can land the airplane there. What I, Paul's point here, and where we can end, end this, it's okay that we have different gifts within the church. That's fine. It's okay that sometimes it looks a little different. I'll share one last story, and we'll end here. When, again, when I was in evangelism school, and this has happened to me several times, there, I had some friends that were just like super dorky conservatives. I mean, just like, I have a lot of friends that are conservative, obviously with the, the path of ministry that I've taken, but these are like wear tents, plaid, baggy, super baggy stuff. I mean, they're like exceptions among even exceptions. And I'm just like, why are they like this? Like, who's going to respond to their ministry? I just don't understand. <laughs> They're just so out there. I mean, like, how can they possibly have an effective ministry? Uh, but he's a, he's a pastor now. He's a pastor up in Michigan. And, you know, I really didn't respond too well to them at first. I was just, like, embarrassed, embarrassed of them a bit at first. But over time, as we worked together and we were able to do some ministry together, I really came to appreciate them as, as wonderful people. And really, I, as I've grown and matured, I've really seen that God is able to use people based on their willingness and uh, to get out and to work. And God gives people opportunities to minister. If you ask God for, minister, for opportunities, he'll give you opportunities. And so I really appreciate them now. So we should be careful, again, 
to not expect others to have our gifts and not expect ourselves to have other gifts. And we all work together to accomplish God's ministry within the church. So we can pray in our closing prayers. I'll do this now and we can transition to Sabbath school for God to be able to help us to identify those ministries and functions in the church that we can participate in. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, Paul, Paul's writings, a lot of it is given to us to understand like how church works. How do we function as a group, as a body of believers? Because when we're in a boat, as a, as a word picture, rowing together, we're able to get farther than if we're just in a little rowboat by ourselves. But together we can accomplish great things as the picture of the body is given to us, functioning as a complete, complete living unit. And so as we continue on in our day, as we continue on in our lives, we ask that you would help us to individually see how you want us to work, give us opportunities to share, even if we don't necessarily see a gift within ourselves to make use of, uh, give us courage to make use of the opportunities that we have. And then as we come together with the body of believers, we just ask that give us grace as we're working with others, give us an appreciation for others that we can weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice and come together as a very large family. And we say this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, we can break up for Sabbath school class now. Obviously, we have several of them. We have one on the other side of the glass over there. We have the large sanctuary class. We've got an adult one in the library, uh, one in Pastor Robot's office, and the young adults are down the hall, and then obviously a bunch of children's ones down this way. So. Okay, all right. <laughs> Good morning, sanctuary class. I'm not Scott, who was supposed to be here today. He ended up having to be elsewhere. Last night I said, well, I'll be there, so you're stuck with me. And uh, welcome to all those who are watching online. Um, I know every week people tune in um, I know when I've been sick, it's been a great thing to be able to tune into both Sabbath school and worship via the internet. Interesting lesson, understanding human nature. Let's start with prayer. Gracious Father, as we spend this time together in your word, we ask that your spirit will be our teacher and that instead of seeing me, we will see Jesus. That's what we really want to see. Help us understand human nature as we study your word today. Amen. What a lesson. Fundamental belief, isn't it? How many of you have been Adventists all your lives? I mean, you grew up in an Adventist home. Okay. Uh, uh, almost half of the people here, which means that the other half of us are... Uh, Gentile aliens who came into the family late, right? I grew up a Roman Catholic here in Dayton, Ohio. 
actually had never even heard of Adventist until I met the girl who's now my wife. That's amazing that you can be so ignorant. This is one of the areas that I was flummoxed by. I was like, what? Where did this idea come from? So it took a while to sort of wrap my mind around it. Now, in 35 years of ministry, I've done evangelism in a, several countries, different states in the United States, uh, different socioeconomic groups present. Um, it has been a fascinating experience. And, you know, some of these things that we study and present, we call testing truths. Like the Sabbath is a big testing truth. If you accept it and follow Jesus, that's, that's a big hurdle for many people to overcome. And part of the reason is because they have grown up Sunday is the Lord's Day. Everybody knows that. And it's hard for them to accept this. I had a lady who had been to every evangelistic campaign our church held in uh, this town in California, and she had been to, because we had them every year, 15 years she had been. Finally, after the 12th year, she asked her son, who was a professor at Tulane University, if he had ever heard of the Seventh-day Sabbath before. He said, yes, she was a Lutheran. He said, what's the question? She said, is it really Saturday? He said, yes. She said, why didn't I know this? She's in her 80s. Why didn't I know this? This is another one of those testing truths. What is the condition of man in death? What is the basis of what is human nature? So we start in Genesis, where everything really starts, and we learn about how people came to be. It's interesting because the verses that are given here, uh, Genesis 1, 24 to 27, and Genesis 2, 7 and 19, talk about God's creation of different parts of the creation. Animals and people. How did God create animals? Okay, he spoke from the dirt though, right? He spoke and up out of the dirt come these, all these different kinds of animals. Each unique and only able to reproduce with others of the same kind. Interesting. Out of the dirt. Out of the dirt. But by the power of his spoken word. All it took was him saying it and the earth responds. Wow. Man, what would that be like to see? But then, at the end of creation week, near the end, the very next to last, the, the penultimate day of creation week. He does something different with the creation of humankind. What does he do? Okay, he's still using dirt. But he is intimately involved. Have you ever done work with clay? Have you ever played with clay? I mean, not, not you know, the Play-Doh mill at home with the two-year-old. I'm talking about, you know, real clay, potter's wheel, the kiln and all that stuff. No, you haven't had that joy? Oh, have you ever pitched horseshoes? With a real horseshoe pit with blue clay? Oh, that's fun. It, it's really different. It, the reason they use blue clay is because when the horseshoe hits, it sticks. It doesn't run all over the yard. Um, but the clay is incredible. It's, it's malleable. It's formable. You can do things with it. One time I was preaching a sermon, and the sermon's title was His Name is Mud, because Adam is literally, in Hebrew, dirt or ground. 
So his name is Mud, or he, because dirt doesn't hold together without a little bit of water. And medical people, you, you could probably tell me the percentages of water to the mud in each human body. But God took that mud, that dirt of Eden, and sculpted it, shaped it. Anybody who's worked with clay on a wheel to make a pot or who has uh, tried to form a statue, you... You've done these things. I gave out everybody, to everybody in the audience when I was preaching His Name is Mud a stick of clay, modeling clay. And I preached about the creation of man. And I encouraged the people in the audience to take their stick of clay and make a little man. And I was busy making my little Adam. And as, when, I, when I got done with him, I took him and I put him on the front of the pulpit expecting that he would stand there. But he was top heavy. And his feet weren't tacky enough to stick to the wood of the pulpit. And so, over he pitched, right onto the communion table, smashed his head in. I said, this is what happens to all of us when we attempt to create ourselves as we think we ought to be. When we try to make ourselves more than what God designed us to be, or we don't appreciate all he has made us to be, and our name is Mud at that point, like his. So, but he goes beyond just doing this incredible piece of artistic work with this clay. What does he do next to this clay? He brings it to life by, yeah, sort of like, uh, we would call it what, artificial respiration or rescue breathing, or I, there's all kinds of terminology for it, but he breathes into this body his own breath. And that clay is transformed. Wow. He imparts to us even more of himself in a very intimate way. Same elements as the animals, but very different. So what happens when we die? We've got the dirt and the breath and man becomes a living soul, is the common translation, a living being, an individual, one unique expression of the image of God. And there he is. So what happens when we die? What does the scripture say? Give me a text. Hmm? Okay, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. What happens to the body? Returns to dust, just like God told them in the Garden of Eden. Dust you are, and to dust you will return. Wow. That's what we came from. That's where we're going. So the spirit returns to God who gave it. And of course, as everyone believes and knows, that spirit is just having the best time in heaven, dancing and singing the praises. Why don't we think that? Because of a text that says, the dead know nothing. Is there anything else the Bible tells us about what actually happens when that spirit, that breath, returns to God who gave it. What else does it say? We sleep in the dust. Their thoughts and their plans cease. Their thoughts and their plans cease. Wow. We all have great plans, right? You know what we're going to do in the future. We've got all this. But when it happens, when death comes, 
heartbeat stops and the breath returns to God who gave it. Nothing is going on here or there. I love, what is it, Colossians 3, verse 2, it says, you have died and your life is hidden in God with Christ. So who we are, what we are, God somehow retains, but it isn't in a conscious entity who is rejoicing in the presence of God. The psalm says, nobody praises you. I think that David said, nobody praises you in heaven, in, in death, or in the grave, right? So what happens in the grave? How is it described throughout the scriptures? Sleep in the grave. Jesus described Lazarus as being asleep. His disciples said, oh, good, if he's sleeping, It'll get better. A couple weeks ago, I was very sick, had a high fever. All I wanted to do was sleep. After a couple of days of sleep, I did feel better. Of course, the z pack helped too. But seriously, if I had taken the drugs and tried to go at the normal rate I go, it would have taken a whole lot longer to recover. Sleep is very essential, restorative. Is that the kind of sleep we're talking about here? Obviously not, because that's what the disciples did not understand. But Jesus was speaking the way the scriptures had spoken since Genesis about what happens, the sleep of death. What happened to David when he died? He slept with his fathers. He was gathered to his fathers. It's a very interesting thing about the, the Hebrew burial practices. You know that they didn't embalm. They, they wrapped you up with some spices to cover up the smell, but then they put you in the grave, and once all of the flesh had rotted away, they would take the bones and gather them up, and they'd put them in a box. They would be gathered. And then they would be stored in these boxes side by side for generations so that you were gathered to your people. It's an interesting practice and a very practical way of expressing what they were doing, a very clear picture of what was going on. So you go to a place like the cave of Machpelah and you find, well, you don't find them there anymore, but. Sarah, right? First person buried in the tomb. Abraham buys it. And it becomes the first piece of the promised land that the patriarch owned and passed down generations. And all those generations, 400 years later, Joseph is brought back and buried there. So all these generations, you find all these bones, these people gathered to their generations, gathered to their people, but they are sleeping until. What happened to David, I asked earlier? It's important because of what Peter says about him at Pentecost. He says, the tomb of the patriarch David is here to this day. Amazing. David remained in the tomb to that day sleeping with the fathers. So what is the nature with which we were created? Are we a, a divided thing or a composite thing? What is the nature of our existence? Mortal. That's the word I was looking for. That, was, that question was a guess what I'm thinking question. And it's the person who's lived with me for 44 years who got the answer. Mortal. Okay. We are mortal. Where did the idea of immortality 
come from then? You shall not surely die. Surely you shall not die. Absolutely certainly you won't die. God wouldn't let that happen to you. Um, I was in a Sabbath school one time, and the Sabbath school teacher said, did God really say that? What? Yeah, he really said, you will certainly die if you do that. So, in death... Body returns to the dust, spirit returns to God who gave it, and we don't praise God, we wait, like David, sleeping with the fathers, gathered with his people, waiting for the great consummation. At Lazarus' tomb, did Martha and Mary think that Lazarus was somewhere alive and praising God? No? What did they think? Okay, he would rise again at the resurrection. When? Well, Jesus had to tell them, at the last day. They don't, or wait a minute, it was Martha that said that, at the last day. Yeah, so they knew that much. So where does this immortality get into our religion from? This idea of the immortality of the soul. Paganism, Lucifer in the Garden of Eden. You know, the amazing thing is, um, the idea that we are immortal had a hard time catching hold among people. Why would that be? In practical terms, well, people are very experimental that is we test things by our experience right so where does the idea come from it doesn't arise naturally in human thought that we are somehow mortal no instead the idea that we are mortal was prevalent throughout the world throughout all philosophical systems and that basically when you died that was it and then they started speculating. There's the important point. Speculating about what happens when you die. Because people began to think, we're pretty amazing. I mean, look around. The animals don't make wheels. Some of them may use tools in a way. But I mean, they don't make things. They don't produce and then you get the beginnings of writing and literature and recording history, and people became uh, more enamored of people. And they began to think, there must be more. But it was all speculation. And then they, there are different creation stories and different pictures of God and how the gods created people, and the predominant picture of how God created people was that God created people to be servants, to serve whatever desire the God may have. That's the pagan. So as a people, as one of the people, you have to serve the God. And for instance, in Egypt, everything in nature could be a God, and you had to appease it so that it would be nice to you. And so that when you died, you would go on to a happy existence. It's interesting that it wasn't until about 800 BC that in the land of the Greeks, the philosophers began to formulate the concept of natural immortality. Wow, the temple was built about 1,000. It would be destroyed in 605. So that gives you a picture of the time period, what's going on around the world. Within Hebrew thought, the concept of natural immortality did not exist. 
I went looking for the oldest reference I could find by a rabbinical teacher, a, a, a teacher of Jewish uh, thought and uh, theology and philosophy, and I couldn't find any instance of any teacher of Jewish theology who thought we had natural immortality until 200 years before Jesus. That's the time when the Greeks were controlling Palestine. And Greek thought, now think about it, they had been in Egypt. They knew what the Egyptians believed and they didn't buy it. Even though, you read the story in Genesis of uh, how when Jacob died, the mourning period and all, apparently Jacob went through the funeral rites of the Egyptians and then was carried back to Israel and buried at Machpelah. Joseph oversaw all that as the vizier of the Pharaoh. And when, when he died, he was treated the same way physically, but he insisted that his people, when God delivered them, take his bones back to Israel as well. So there we see the patriarchs did not buy into the pagan thought current among the Egyptians. So that idea, even though they were familiar with it, they knew about it, never made it into Jewish thought. In fact, you won't find it in any of the canonical scriptures. You will find it in the Apocrypha. You know what those are. The extra books of the Bible, the ones that Protestants have said, no, nope, that's not part of the uh, canon. We won't take that as a measure, as a place to find what we believe or teach. There are some churches that do. They include it in, within the covers of their Bibles. And there are some Protestant churches that even accept the philosophy without accepting the books. So they have no basis from the scriptures for teaching immortality of the soul. I have a Catholic uh, commentary on my bookshelf, and it's interesting, in the article on immortality, it says, nowhere do the scriptures teach the immortality of the soul. And then it goes on to say, and this is why we believe in it. Because the scriptures don't teach it? Wow, what a stark admission. I couldn't believe it when I read it. That's why I had to buy that volume. I thought oh, that's worth having. <coughs> they admit it's not there, but they believe it anyway. So, yeah. Wasn't that the problem in Jesus' day, though? Was it? Isaiah's testimony, Jeremiah's testimony, and so on. So do we not just have a simple replication of what's happened already in history? Everybody think that's the case? That what we have going on with the idea of the immortality of the soul is we've just borrowed it and based it on tradition. It's an accepted, everybody thinks it, so I'll think it too. Is that the way it works? Idea of death. And I, think all I don't think we should be comfortable with the idea of death. Right. That's why I made a general statement. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm saying that because of that, people feel comfortable or comforted to know that their loved ones, and I'm hearing it on television and so on, mm -hmm. they're smiling down on them and they're looking right. at them, all kinds Books of Books are emotions. published, movies are made. 60 seconds in heaven or whatever. It's an enemy. And even though they do not fully understand the whole concept of death, they feel comforted to know that that is the state 
of affairs of their loved ones. Yeah. In teaching this in evangelism, that is the biggest obstacle to teaching this particular, because people are comforted. And I actually had somebody say, you took my grandma and put her back in the grave. I said, no, I didn't do it. <laughs> she never left the grave. Whoa. Um, why is it comforting to think that they are in heaven? Because at least they got one thing right. That's <laughs> okay, heaven is a good place, so it's good that they're there. Jesus is there, so they are. Luke 16, isn't it? The parable of the rich man and Lazarus? You know the parable I'm talking about. The rich man has everything in life, ends up in hell. Lazarus, the poor beggar at the gate, dies, and he ends up in the bosom of Abraham. The rich man says, Father Abraham, have him bring me a drop of water. What does this parable teach? That they are alive and conscious and speaking in heaven and hell? Does it teach that? Do people interpret it that way? Yes, people do. It's probably the trickiest of the parables. But what's the point of it? What does Jesus come down bottom line in this parable to? First, he says, there's a dividing wall between the saved and the lost, and you can't cross. Nobody can come from this state to that state. Can't even send somebody from heaven to speak to people who are alive on earth. Think about that. What about ghosts? We're coming up on the ghost holiday, right? Another effort by the devil to hide the truth about the character of God. Pretty successful from the looks of the decorations on the lawns in my neighborhood. My goodness, the things people put in their front yards. Uh, the bottom line of the parable in Luke 16 is, if they don't accept Moses, they wouldn't believe it if somebody came back from the dead. Did somebody come back from the dead? Jesus did. Yeah, and they still wouldn't because they wouldn't accept the scriptures. We hear a lot these days about worldview. Bottom line, the biblical worldview says, I will not believe it unless the scriptures teach it. Now, does that mean that we can throw out all science? Obviously not. But at the same time, we must be very careful not to make the lab coat the high priestly garment. Right? Very grave danger in making science our God. I won't believe it unless the scriptures teach it. That has to be the basis of our worldview, and that has to be our understanding of our human nature. If the scriptures don't teach it, I can't accept it. I can test it, I can investigate it, but unless the scriptures teach it, I don't have to adopt it into my life, I don't have to practice it, and that's what's important. So these people who tell me you pulled grandma out and of heaven and put her back in the grave. No, what do the scriptures say? You have to go back to that. It's always difficult because you're dealing with the emotional heart of people. Yes? Uh, happy Sabbath Day coming. Yeah. What you are experiencing right now is not something new. Right. It was there before. Yes. I remember when King Ahab, he could not tolerate the thought of anything different. He needed good news. Remember, King Saul, he wanted to hear everything good. In the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, it says that, 
for the time will come when they not endure sound doctrine, yes. but having eating ears, they shall keep to themselves teachers in accordance with their own lusts. Yep. Yeah, you have someone like so your grandma, like you say, is not in heaven. Right. They don't want to hear that. They, they don't, don't want to hear. It. They just want to hear that their grandma is smiling at them. Actually, he gave, she gave to me on a dream yesterday night. <laughs> if you tell them that, they get something out of it. Even the politicians have confirmed <coughs> that. Like, you know, people like, like to hear what they want to hear. Mm -hmm. Just tell them, look, immigrants are coming from the southern border and they are taking away your jobs. Give me this vote. People want to hear that. This vote that people want to hear. Yeah. This world, if you, if you play by the rules, if you play by the book, if you tell them the truth, nobody will listen. Mm -hmm. You have to tell them what they want to hear. Yeah. Do we have to tell them what they want to hear? Do we have to accept that what they want to hear is what we have to believe and teach? My dad's little sister was a Carmelite nun. Okay? And she was in a convent that they didn't leave the grounds. She didn't leave the one acre of the convent grounds for 40 years because it was a cloister convent. However, she was a devoted student of the scriptures. When my father died and she attended the funeral, she got us all together around the casket just before the um, uh, funeral director closed it. And she said, okay, everybody, everybody look at Don. Everybody look at Don. Everybody looking at Don. Okay, remember this. He is sleeping. Go home, get a good night's sleep. We'll see you at the church at 10 in the morning for the funeral. This is a Catholic nun telling my Catholic families, uh, members, all he is sleeping. I walk out, put my arm around her. She's a little lady. And I said, sister, sister, where do you think Pop is? And she said, you and I both know he's in that box. He'll stay there till Jesus comes. She understood from the scriptures what happens when we die. Catholic nun. So she said it in a way that, though they didn't, maybe didn't want to hear it, she said it in a way, and she had a position that they could accept it. She was a nun. If I had said that, <laughs> right, they would have hated me. So that's something. The relationship makes a difference when we are presenting these things, which is why evangelists are challenged in presenting the scriptures because the evangelist doesn't have the relationship with the people, which is why it's so essential, like our earlier talk about spiritual gifts, is that people bring their friends to evangelistic meetings, and then you can, as the friend, bridge the gap between the teaching of the evangelist and the individual who's going, what? How can you believe this stuff? Because God's word teaches it, and I have a relationship with you, and so I now you can say, well, if you believe it, maybe I can believe it. And then the whole thing is, though, to keep pointing them to Jesus. Why is it that we don't grieve as others grieve then? Do we grieve when our family dies? I thought of my dad every day for almost a year after he died. Did I speak to him every day the year before he died? No. But that was the grief process for me. But like she said, he's sleeping till Jesus calls him out. She believed that because he had faith in Jesus, Jesus was gonna call him out, gonna call him up in the great resurrection of the righteous. So though I grieved, she and I had a, a shared grief experience with the blessed hope to anchor it. That's the good news. We may not know if our loved ones are in that condition. She assumed that because he was a good Catholic, <laughs> he would rise in the resurrection of the righteous. I don't know what else she knew about his relationship with God.
But we can be sure that even if we don't know the spiritual condition of our loved ones who, who pass into death, that God loves them so much that if there is any way that he can save them, they will be saved. If they have trusted in him, they will be saved. Think of the thief on the cross. I mean, you can think of a million examples. We can't know all things about the people, but God does. And God loves so much, he gave. He didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Does that mean everybody's saved? Does that mean everybody's going to be in heaven? No. The nature of man is conditional mortality. I was talking about the earliest Hebrew writing that says that. It's interesting that in Jesus' day, there was a division between the two schools. We talk about Hillel and Gamaliel, and we talk about uh, and Shammai, the two schools of thought within the Hebrew world about the Messiah and about the law. There were two schools of thought in the Jewish world about conditional mortality and innate immortality at the time of Christ. The people who believed in immortality of the soul were the Hellenists, the Sadducees, the ones who had fallen into the Greek and Roman culture, the pagan group. They became predominant even though the Pharisees were the only ones that survived the destruction of the temple. But the Pharisaical teaching of the natural mortality and conditional immortality was subsumed by the loss of the temple. And now they needed a way to be immortal. And they adopted the Greek way of thinking. That's why it is so important that we know what the scriptures say and hold to the scriptures. So for all of us, the important thing to know is, what do the scriptures say? If the Bible says it, I believe it. Hold on to that. And in spite of what we're surrounded by, even with Halloween coming up, know that Jesus conquered death, that he has reserved a place for us in heaven. He is preparing a place for us we will sleep until he comes and calls us forth, but his coming is sure, and we can live forever. We will not perish, but we will have eternal life. We are told to seek immortality. We don't have immortality. Uh, we could go on and on. There's so much more in this lesson. Thank you. Good input today. Um, it's time for us to draw this to a close. So let's close with prayer. Father, we thank you for the assurance of the scriptures that teach us that you love us so much that you created us to be with you and that you have provided Jesus to bring that to pass. We may be mortal now, but by receiving Jesus Christ, we receive eternal life. And when he returns, this mortal shall be transformed and we will receive the gift of immortality. We thank you for the assurance in your word. Lord, keep us faithful. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.